Um, well, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining. My name is Boris Rensky. I am a co-founder and chief marketing officer at uh, Morantis. And uh, today we're going to talk about uh, OpenStack cooperation, um, a view of it from uh, kind of uh, within inside. Um, we are kind of a, an active participant in the OpenStack ecosystem. I am uh, on uh, uh, the OpenStack board, so a lot of you might be reading a lot of uh, different press releases and kind of figuring out how OpenStack world works. And I wanted to give uh, everybody kind of a, uh, a view from, from inside. Um, as a chief marketing officer, my job, Marantis, is actually to pretty much do exactly that. I uh, continuously monitor the uh, OpenStack ecosystem, uh, how the different players kind of behave, what new offerings they push to the market, and uh, try to figure out how uh, we should uh, adjust um, our strategy as a company. So I'd like to uh, start with uh, the definition of co-opetition. And uh, just uh, by kind of a, a view of hands, I was wondering how many of you actually know what that is. So raise your hand if you know what co-opetition is. OK, so that's like five people out of, what, 30? Um, that's not very surprising, uh, but uh, I, I myself have uh, learned uh, uh, the fact that such a term exists only after we started participating in the uh, um, OpenStack ecosystem, which is a co coopetitive ecosystem, so to speak. So I pulled up the definition of what it is. I want to read it out loud. So coopetition takes place when companies that are in the same market work together in exploration of knowledge and research of new products at the same time that they compete for market share of their products and the exploitation of the knowledge created. So that's a very long and complicated mouthful, and there's a kind of an easier way to define it, I think. Uh, so if you look at the OpenStack from the outside, if you look at the keynotes and things like that, um, OpenStack from the outside kind of looks like this, a big happy party of a bunch of people. And uh, this is Jonathan Bryce, um, the uh, head of the uh, OpenStack Foundation. But uh, from the inside, the picture is uh, very different, and uh, it looks more like this, uh, which is uh, nothing like the picture before. Um, and I wanted to kind of uh, explain specifics of uh, what that looks like uh, during this presentation. Uh, so we'll look at three things, really. We'll look at uh, the territories that are being conquered um, in the OpenStack ecosystem. Uh, we'll look at the weapons that uh, the different companies choose to use to conquer those territories. And uh, I'll also give a, kind of a quick highlight of uh, the key battles being currently fought. So territory is being conquered, first part. And uh, in uh, talking about it, I specifically decided to choose kind of a metaphor of uh, kind of an island with, with territories and small islands around it. And uh, this right there, the big chunk, is uh, uh, the biggest kind of most valuable treasure island territory that most companies are battling for. And uh, I call it the uh, OpenStack Distro Treasure Island. Uh, the guys that are battling for it are Red Hat, Susie, um, Mirantis, um, and Canonical. Um, and uh, the uh, island actually has uh, beachheads. Uh, beachheads are the uh, um, areas that are the easiest to attack and conquer to begin with. And uh, there's three beachheads that I've identified. The first beachhead is uh, what I refer to as the services beachhead. There's a training beachhead, and then there's an upstream influence beachhead. And uh, conquering those three beachheads is uh, instrumental to ultimately taking control of the OpenStack distribution island. Now, in addition to the OpenStack distro island, you have kind of a small islands around it. And uh, this is something that uh, analysts nowadays like to refer to as uh, the uh, OpenStack products and solutions island. So let's try and uh, kind of quantify this. There is, I can tell you right away that there is no accurate numbers with respect to kind of the size of the market for any of those territories, but uh, some of the analysts have started speculating. So the OpenStack distro market, according to the uh, report from the 451 group, the recent report, is uh, 52 million in 2013, uh, growing to 82 million in 2014. Um, again, those are ballparks. Um, but, uh, you know, as somebody who's participating in that market, I think that uh, uh, through the bottoms-up analysis, that's maybe somewhat accurate at this point. 
and uh, the uh, OpenStack products and solutions, all of the islands they are combined together, is uh, roughly 31 million in uh, 2013, growing to be uh, 49 million uh, next year. Now, in uh, kind of creating this metaphor with the OpenStack island being the uh, uh, big treasure island, um, it, I think it's kind of a leap of faith when it comes to OpenStack. Um, it's not for sure at this point that distro is the treasure that you should be going after. And uh, it is quite possible that uh, this island will just end up being a desert and there's going to be absolutely no money to be made. Um, while uh, the small kind of products and solutions islands uh, on the periphery will actually be the oasis and this is where, you know, uh, the guys will uh, uh, build great companies and create a lot of value. So going forward, I'd like to uh, kind of uh, take a look at uh, each of the beachheads um, in a little bit more detail. The first one is a services beachhead. Um, why is it a beachhead and uh, why I think that uh, uh, it's important to conquer it? Um, I think that uh, the history so far has shown that uh, with uh, any early and particularly complex like OpenStack uh, project, um, services is the first thing that companies start buying. And uh, the reason why it's important to conquer this beachhead early on is because in new markets, it's impossible to just build a random hypothesis about uh, how you're going to make money or what customers are going to ultimately buy. And uh, by conquering the services beachhead, you're actually able to uh, um, harness the early adopters and uh, get close to the customers and learn how the customers are actually using the software, uh, then ultimately tailoring whatever goes into your offering, into your distro, uh, in a way that would be relevant to the customer. Um, another thing that uh, it allows you to do early on, because services, again, is something that uh, customers uh, pay for uh, in the early days of the market evolution, is uh, you can build reputation. Uh, you get the opportunity to build reputation and uh, get a lot of customer logos, which is important um, if you're going after the uh, uh, big territory afterwards. I did a talk um, about uh, a year ago, um, at uh, uh, two summits ago, uh, when I talked about how to make money in OpenStack, and I uh, talked about how the market's going to be adopting um, OpenStack software. And uh, I kind of threw out the hypothesis that uh, up until uh, the end of uh, 2013, the primary buyers of OpenStack is going to be uh, technology and infrastructure companies themselves and uh, service providers and uh, Web 2.0 companies. Um, and uh, the thing that uh, these companies uh, tend to do is uh, they don't like buying products because oftentimes, or more often than not, rather, they have an enormous army of uh, smart engineers already working for them, and oftentimes they're able to uh, build software, particularly infrastructure space, better than any outside vendor can. So they would just buy some services uh, to help augment their bench. Um, the uh, um, 2014, I believe, is going to be uh, the year where uh, enterprise adoption, the traditional enterprise adoption of uh, OpenStack is going to start happening. So let's take a look at uh, uh, who's uh, attacking the uh, services beachhead. So we, Marantis, we were the guys that uh, kind of believed in uh, this beachhead early on. And uh, day one, we positioned ourselves as the services company for OpenStack. Um, and I think that uh, I can say with a certain degree of confidence that we were able to, uh, uh, to a large extent, conquer this beachhead. We've done uh, um, over 70 OpenStack deployments during the course of the last two and a half years. And uh, we have uh, roughly 370 OpenStack engineers on the bench doing OpenStack services. Um, the guys that are attacking the beachhead that uh, I think that we have conquered um, are as follows. Rackspace, um, they have a different business model. Their business model is not distro. Their business model is about uh, um, managed hosting effectively, building a, um, a cloud in your data center. Uh, but despite this go-to-market model, um, we do know uh, that uh, they actually do um, simply services. And in fact, uh, there's uh, uh, press releases out there, and we know firsthand uh, where, uh, for instance, Rackspace has done some services for companies like Sony Entertainment that didn't have to do much with uh, um, actually providing a managed hosting service. 
Ubuntu is another guy uh, that, uh, well, canonical rather, that we see in uh, competitive uh, tenders quite often. And uh, they perform services tied to specifically the Ubuntu stack. And finally, um, now that uh, Red Hat Distribution's out and uh, these guys are the credible players pushing forward, uh, we do see them in competitive tenders quite a bit as well. Um, and naturally, um, they do services for their stack. So let's talk about the training beachhead. Um, why this, this is a beachhead and why, why is it important? So a lot of the companies uh, in the OpenStack ecosystem today doing training, they really see training as a really revenue source. There is some companies that don't have any product strategy um, and they just do training. They're just training companies. Um, but the reality is that uh, training is not just the revenue source. Training is uh, the opportunity to actually indoctrinate the uh, evolving ecosystem with uh, um, your opinion. And uh, let me kind of uh, um, quantify or qualify that rather. Um, the opinion can be um, a fairly loose term. It doesn't mean that my opinion and this is, you know, this is, this is what OpenStack configuration looks like. It can be a lot of different things. So our opinion in Marantis, for instance, is uh, that OpenStack was uh, originally envisioned as uh, this uh, uh, fabric that would uh, uh, tie together a very diverse set of uh, um, infrastructure vendors and overlay uh, kind of a unifying control fabric over this diverse set of, uh, uh, of uh, infrastructure components. And this is exactly what OpenStack was started for uh, back uh, when, particularly Nova part of it, uh, when uh, it was first created by NASA. Um, Red Hat might, for instance, uh, in doing their training, have a, um, a different opinion that they'd like to indoctrinate the ecosystem on. And their opinion can be that uh, um, having an unlimited number of configurations and being able to tie together all the different infrastructure components is impossible, so you have to limit the uh, uh, set of configuration options, so to speak, or set of choices that a customer gets to uh, a more narrowly defined stack, which, of course, should be the Red Hat stack of components, such as it should be RHEL, um, it should ideally be things like uh, Gluster for storage, and it should be KVM for the hypervisor. Um, which I'm not saying it's a bad approach. We'll see which one's better. Um, the time will show. But uh, ultimately, that's their opinion. And in their training, they will be indoctrinating that opinion to the ecosystem. And uh, another proof point, I think, uh, of uh, why I believe training to be beachhead is uh, uh, some of you may not know that, but uh, um, we know Red Hat pretty intimately. And uh, we know how uh, they've kind of uh, um, evolved to be the leader in the uh, Linux distribution space. And the thing that was absolutely paramount to their success is uh, specifically around their training. They've introduced a very rigorous training program and certification program for Linux, um, ultimately indoctrinating a bunch of sysadmins um, about uh, how to properly administer, how to deploy and manage Linux environments. And then the sysadmins got hired all over the place and uh, they bring this knowledge to the customer, and the customer wanted Linux, they'd say, well, Red Hat are the guys to actually go to for Linux. So let's look at who's attacking the uh, training beachhead. Uh, the two guys that uh, kind of started out on this, the first guy was Rackspace. We've uh, launched our training offering shortly after, and I uh, would like to believe that uh, between us and uh, um, Rackspace, we're kind of uh, still controlling this beachhead for now. Um, but uh, Red Hat absolutely knows the value of uh, winning this beachhead, and uh, they're pounding just crazy to uh, uh, do whatever they can to conquer the beachhead, just throwing nuclear bombs. Um, and uh, everybody else at this point is also doing OpenStack training. Some of that is really a uh, byproduct of the OpenStack Foundation launching the uh, training marketplace recently. But, uh, um, I think that uh, a lot of the players uh, that are kind of uh, on the bottom right quadrant there are just doing training for the sake of training, not for the sake of actually indoctrinating the ecosystem with a particular opinion. So third beachhead, upstream influence. So this is a surprisingly not very well understood beachhead by a lot of the guys in the OpenStack ecosystem today. And uh, I think I'd like to explain it by uh, reading out loud a few quotes that uh, I found enlightening about why winning the upstream uh, influence beachhead is important. Um, 
if you were going to buy a service contract for your open source software, would you prefer your service provider actually be the certifiable authority on that very software? So this very one, uh, good question to think about. Um, second, um, in open source being the source of the source code matters most. Since open source developers essentially give away software for free, the key to monetization lies in being known as the source of the code. Um, so let's take a look at some of the important kind of a supporting historic facts. So um, let's see if this thing works. Well, OK. So this right here is uh, the list of contributors to the Linux kernel. The interesting thing that uh, we can see right away is that Red Hat right there, um, historically, has always been the number one contributor to the Linux kernel because these guys know the importance of the upstream influence beachhead. Um, let's look at uh, some of the more recent examples. This really here is uh, contributions to uh, Hadoop. Um, the guys that are uh, the leaders in uh, Hadoop distributions today is uh, Cloudera and Hortonworks. And uh, of course, right there, Cloudera, Yahoo, which technically is Hortonworks now, um, and Hortonworks themselves are the key uh, uh, contributors of code to um, upstream uh, Apache Hadoop. So I think that uh, uh, to just kind of uh, um, um, list some, some concrete points of why it's important, uh, rather than use just historic facts and quotes, um, in participating upstream, you're actually able to shape uh, the roadmap of whatever product you're selling to the customer as a distribution. Moreover, I think in order to be successful um, in the distro game, um, you have to really, your, your whole organization has to really be wrapped around and believe that building software in an open source way is the better way to do it, harnessing the knowledge and power of the ecosystem. In very pragmatic terms, that means that uh, if you have the upstream influence for the customer, you can just land patches upstream faster. Um, and uh, most customers that buy a distro rather than the product, what they buy, they don't just buy a piece of software from you. They see you as a gateway to the community. They expect you to be their advocate in the community. And without the upstream influence, there's no way that you can do it. Um, so there's two ways to uh, really kind of monetize open source. And this is, I'm going to go off on a little bit of a tangent, uh, still talking about the upstream influence beachhead. But uh, there is a... a um, a way to do it where you are kind of the source of the code, as we talked about in uh, some of the quotes that I've listed. And uh, then there is also kind of an open core model uh, where, you know, the, the open source part is just the open core, and then you have a bunch of value-add proprietary solutions that you differentiate with. Um, so the, you know, source of the source code um, is the Red Hat and Hortonworks model. Uh, the uh, proprietary value-add or open core model is, uh, you know, for instance, a Cloudera model. But uh, I think that it's particularly important that uh, uh, whoever wants to succeed <coughs> in uh, uh, the distro game in OpenStack understands that uh, there is no core, uh, there is no open core model in OpenStack. And part of the reason why, because I think that uh, in OpenStack, at least today, and uh, for the virtue of open, what OpenStack is in general, um, OpenStack doesn't really have a core. So let me explain. Um, even deeper what I mean by that. So OpenStack, and I'm, I'm just going to talk about the compute part of OpenStack, kind of the Nova stack of OpenStack. Started out about three years ago, just a small kind of set of projects. And uh, the first thing that happened um, immediately when OpenStack just came out, there's a bunch of uh, product slash distro vendors that uh, appeared. And uh, what they said, well, you know, Cloud's great, but with cloud, you actually need metering and billing. So I'm going to build uh, some uh, proprietary hooks to do billing and metering for OpenStack, and uh, that'll be my value add. So lo and behold, in just a little bit of time, um, OpenStack added Solometer that uh, is now the default uh, metering project for OpenStack that is also now going into monitoring that has eradicated a lot of the value. So these guys that have built their proprietary solutions and weren't doing it uh, as part of the kind of upstream community, they're pretty much toast. Um, and let's move on. Um, another kind of set of uh, value-add components around OpenStack historically, um, around orchestration and configuration management. So some of you might not agree with me, but uh, I believe that uh, these guys are being threatened as well. Uh, what's happening right now, OpenStack has heat. 
heat is the started out as kind of the cloud formations project, but now it's the official orchestration engine for OpenStack. Uh, it doesn't just do provisioning of the infrastructure. It does open, you can use it for, to actually do the OpenStack deployment. And uh, some of the recent blueprints, such as a heat software blueprint, very much, I think, eat away at the value of uh, uh, things like uh, even Puppet and Chef, a basic configuration management. So now we're going to get even to a better part. Every product um, or you know, every, every vendor that's been trying to kind of monetize OpenStack, the one thing that they did is they said, okay, well, OpenStack is a cool product, but you need to be able to deploy it and you need to be able to manage it. So what we're going to do is we're going to build uh, you know, our suite for deployment and management of OpenStack. So with that in mind, kind of uh, non-upstream uh, um, initiatives have emerged. Some of them are proprietary deployment management engines. Some of them are open source, but none of them are really kind of uh, deep upstream. Um, so what happens next? Bam. Uh, HP and Red Hat, they being the smart upstream guys, they start Project Triple O and Tuscar, um, all these other deployment tools, long term, potentially toast. Um, and this actually can keep, keeps going. So the, the recent big hype that has happened now is uh, there's a lot of platform as a service vendors. They're saying we build our platform as a service. And uh, what we're going to do is, uh, you know, we're going to use OpenStack as one of the uh, infrastructure as a service engines underneath. Um, we actually wrote a blog about it. Hey, guys, you know, that's maybe not the right way to, uh, uh, you, 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 you might be threatened by upstream OpenStack. And we didn't know anything about this. But literally, after we wrote the blog, two days later, bam, Project Solom, which is a native platform as a service for OpenStack. So, there is no core in OpenStack, is my point. And uh, by trying to build value at around rather than working upstream, um, you'll just waste a bunch of time and money and uh, build kind of a proprietary island. So my kind of encouragement to everybody is instead of trying to go the proprietary route, go ahead and start working upstream. If you see a gap, if you see something value add, be the evangelist of it upstream and uh, harness the points for actually having evangelized it upstream and having been the first one. So let's take a quick look at uh, the upstream kind of uh, influence beachhead state of play. Red Hat, um, smart guys know how to do open source. So they are the first ones to kind of pound on the beachhead. And uh, arguably, they've uh, reached a, a fair amount of success. So if you measure by commits across all projects, um, Red Hat has been steady, kind of a number one contributor to our OpenStack since Folsom. But uh, there's a bunch of guys that kind of continue pounding at the upstream influence beachhead. Rackspace historically been number one. They've uh, actually been displaced to now number three. They're slowly losing control of that beachhead. Us, um, we were kind of challenged with a problem of uh, having to educate an army of Russians of how to work upstream, which is a very alien thing for the Russian engineer to do. They tend to just kind of, you know, have their opinion about how things should be implemented and write code, and that's not how you do development upstream. But we've been making steady progress, and actually we've moved since uh, uh, just the last release. We were number 16 in Grizzly. We came out number five uh, across uh, all commits, across all core OpenStack projects. HP, also fairly smart guys, know how to do open source. They've been holding steady ground at number four. Um, IBM actually been increasing their pace slowly. So they're moved from number six in Folsom to now number two in Havana. Um, and finally, uh, another company that actually seems to actually know the value of upstream influence is Innovance. And they're steadily gaining Folsom number 11, Grizzly number seven, Havana number six. Um, there is various ways, though, to measure um, upstream influence. It's not just about commits to core projects. There's a lot of initiatives happening. So if you look at, the, for example, uh, who commits most documentation, uh, the picture looks different than if you just measure across the projects. If you look at, uh, for example, StackForge, which is a sandbox for kind of new projects on OpenStack uh, or related projects, they're not guaranteed that they'll ever be adopted by the broader community or be made into the integrated release, but still it's kind of like the innovation sandbox. So the picture is also very different. Red Hat is number six. Um, and we've been doing crap load on StackForge. And uh, you, know, you can keep slicing and dicing it. So uh, for example, if you look by project, uh, then in Nova, um, IBM's number one committer. Um, if you look at Cinder, which is very core, um, 
HP is a number one committer. If you look at Neutron, VMware um, is a number one committer. So let's take a look uh, at some of the uh, islands as I'm about to close on the uh, territory stock. Um, let's take a look at uh, some of the islands uh, that surround the uh, Distro Treasure Island. There is an AWS Fidelity Island, um, Enterprise OpenStack Island, uh, Managed Services Island, and then uh, what I refer to as the OpenStack Appliance Island, and then there's a complementary products island. And on each island, there is a currently kind of a respective occupant that is um, you know, sitting there and protecting their territory. Cloud scaling is the AWS Fidelity guys. Piston is the you know, enterprise substitute to VMware and the enterprise um, type uh, guys. Uh, managed services, this island is going to get crowded. So right now you have uh, Rackspace and MetaCloud, but uh, HP and IBM are starting to kind of get their game together, and uh, I think that once that happens, they're just going to drop a nuclear bomb on this island. Um, OpenStack Appliance Island versus Nebula and Morph Labs. And Complementary Products Island is uh, just random value-add technologies that try to piggyback or hold on to the uh, momentum of OpenStack. And uh, there's many companies there, but I think my subjective opinion that uh, Ink Tank, with their self storage, are the guys that uh, actually probably benefited the most and played it the wisest. Um, and if you just look at the territory, um, I think that we're still kind of a controlling the services beachhead. Um, we're sharing the beachhead of training um, with uh, Rackspace. Um, and Red Hat's pounding hard, as I've said. And Red Hat's sitting kind of uh, and hold on. They're holding on very hard on the upstream influence beachhead. So look now uh, at some of the weapons that companies use. Um, marketing and PR is the number one weapon. Um, and marketing and PR is just kind of like a, almost like a doping pill. So you have certain capabilities or certain strengths, and then you can swallow this pill, and uh, you know, you'll, you'll be stronger for, for a little while. Um, so Red Hat, um, you know, their positioning is that we own the upstream influence beachhead, and we'll do for OpenStack what we did for Linux. So you know, hey, we're cool upstream, and you know, we know how to do it. We've done it before. So we'll, we'll, we'll be the winner. Stick with us. Canonical, they are pimping the uh, number one host OS for OpenStack. They are the most popular host OS, um, and they're pushing hard on that. Rackspace, their message is, we started OpenStack. Um, our message is, we are pure play OpenStack, uh, and we don't have any kind of a uh, portfolio product baggage around us. We just focus on OpenStack, so we're not going to push you to use KVM as a hypervisor or RHEL as a host OS necessarily. Um, cloud scaling, they're like, we have the opinion, and our opinion is that um, OpenStack should look like uh, AWS. Uh, Piston, again, it's, we started OpenStack, but we're fun. Um, and then the two guys, IBM and HP, for understandable reason, um, you know, we are IBM bitch, but <laughs> the, the main thing is they, we are committed. And there's, there's a lot of value in it because for IBM, they don't need to prove to the customer that you know, they are cool or they're a good, good partner. They already have all the customers. So they just need to prove to the customer that they are committed to this new technology. And the guys that have been buying IBM for the last 50 years, now that IBM brings this technology to them, they'll buy it from IBM. The same goes from HP. And uh, I think that the, this is the excerpts from uh, kind of the opening statements, the opening descriptions of how companies position themselves coming into the summit. So you can look, this is the Red Hat description. So they're pimping the upstream influence beachhead as far as hard as they can. We are the top code committer, opening line. And of course, Canonical, oh, we are the most popular host operating system for OpenStack. Um, again, some of the headlines, um, you know, IBM and HP, they're all focused about, you know, we are committed, we are committed. This is their message. Account control. So this is a, a weapon that few are privy to. Uh, Marantz, Cloud, Staling, Piston, we don't have account control. Uh, guys like HP, IBM, Red Hat have account control. What does it mean? Uh, it means that Mr. Customer, um, you know, I've been selling you shit for a long time. Um, I've never let you down. Buy from me. Um, the problem of account control is that uh, it can sometimes be a double-edged sword because uh, the customer ultimately knows you as somebody who's been selling him shit X. So that means that 
potentially by introducing something like OpenStack into the mix, the reason why you're doing it is because you want to sell more of that shit X. Um, and there's actually history uh, that, uh, that, 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 that shows how this can be a double-edged sword. And I think that the very good example of how that history plays out is Red Hat themselves. Because uh, if you remember back to Unix Wars, uh, the guys, the powerful giants, were really Sun, HP, and IBM, which had their proprietary versions of Unix that were just tied to their expensive mainframes that was this main shit that they were selling to the customers for a long time. And then came Red Hat and said, well, you know, we'll liberate Linux. You can have any kind of vendor. Now, you know, you don't, you don't need the expensive mainframe. And it cut down the uh, cost of uh, uh, computing um, by, by an order of magnitude. And ultimately, that, that worked for them. So another interesting weapon is partnerships. Uh, partnerships can be viewed as a shield from account control to some extent, um, because the guys that uh, have account control, like I said, their account control is tied to certain baggage always. Um, and uh, you can mitigate that with partnerships. So um, some examples. Um, Mark Shuttleworth invested $1 million into Ceph Storage. Um, so one way to look at it is Mark Shuttleworth is a brilliant entrepreneur, and he believes that uh, Ceph Storage is a great great product is going to make a lot of money on the exit. The other way to look at it is uh, he's basically saying up yours to Red Hat by saying that Canonical is best friends now with Ceph, and Ceph is better than Gluster. Um, another is uh, SUSE Cloud 2.0, recent, pre recent press release, um, specifically focusing on compatibility around Hyper-V. Um, again, very similar message. Uh, it can be interpreted as basically SUSE saying, well, you know, Red Hat, They'll make you work with KVM, but we are all open. You can do Hyper-V, and you can do VMware. Um, another one um, is uh, Plum Grid and uh, Red Hat shake hands. So one way to look at it is you know, Plum Grid has bought into the brilliance of the Red Hat OpenStack distribution. Another way to look at it, my pragmatic Russian way to look at it is maybe Red Hat is just kind of saying uh, up yours to uh, VMware that uh, is uh, competing with them uh, around virtualization technology. So all this fun and games aside, I think that the most important weapon that uh, you can use is really kind of a focus on technology and focus on customer. You need to make stuff that is relevant to the customer and that stuff needs to work. And that's the bottom line. And, there's a lot of, and the reason why I bring it up is because there's a lot of speculation where like, the best technology doesn't always win. That's kind of a common theme. Yeah, so we have a great technology, but these guys are really powerful, and they're able to outcompete us with partnerships and marketing and things like that. I think it's to some extent true, but I personally believe that good technology almost always wins. So uh, in you know, trying to use different weapons, it's important not to get distracted away and uh, uh, you know, produce a lot of great partnerships and marketing, but build crap technology. So to uh, close, I wanted to uh, uh, kind of highlight some of the interesting battles that are happening in the uh, uh, ecosystem. Um, and uh, so this is one battle that uh, maybe some of you saw. Um, and uh, the point of the battle is as follows. Um, certain companies uh, with uh, cloud scaling kind of in the lead, uh, being the cheerleader, believe that uh, effectively Amazon has won the, uh, uh, the cloud wars. Most of the guys that have been indoctrinated into cloud uh, were indoctrinated by Amazon. So uh, instead of uh, being antagonistic to Amazon, what OpenStack should do is really embrace everything Amazon. Embrace Amazon APIs, embrace Amazon implementation, become effectively an Amazon software that customers can use. Um, the alternative kind of viewpoint is that you know, API really doesn't matter. Um, and uh, that uh, obsessing with uh, somebody like Amazon could potentially uh, drive the OpenStack community to uh, miss some of the important things that are actually relevant to the customers. And uh, for every battle, I kind of put this uh, you know, um, bullshit meter on the bottom, um, measuring you know, how much of this battle is really about technology and you know, substance, and how much of it is just kind of a PR bullshit. So I think that this one is probably mostly PR bullshit, but I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, the battle of host OS. So this one's kind of interesting. Naturally, you know, Red Hat Canonical SUSE, they control Linux distribution. Uh, so what they say is that, well, you cannot have an OpenStack distribution if you don't have an underlying host OS distribution. 
Um, and uh, there's you know, a whole bunch of reasons given uh, to that effect. You need to be able to actually fix bugs in the host OS because host OS is what uh, the uh, OpenStack distribution runs on. Um, and uh, ideally, you should have optimized the host OS to make OpenStack run better. Um, and you should have the ability to support the entire stack. Now, uh, there's a whole different camp of guys. And uh, I think that kind of Rackspace is the main cheerleader there. It says that, OK, well, host OS is just one component. But there's a lot of components on OpenStack. Host OS is not the only one. There is, for example, MySQL that uh, Red Hat does not control. There is uh, RabbitMQ, which uh, Red Hat chose to substitute for something else, for Cupid. Um, and there's many deployments of OpenStack where people don't want, uh, for example, your host OS. Um, and the interesting thing that has happened is uh, actually this, this kind of new whole theme is that uh, no host OS is optimal for OpenStack. There should be a native cloud OS. Uh, so there's a peculiar project that has been invested in by Lou Moorman, who is the president of uh, uh, Rackspace, uh, called CoreOS, that they're building just the new Linux distribution optimized just for cloud. And the idea is that, you know, I'm guessing they're hoping that they're going to become the native uh, OS for OpenStack. So again, the uh, bullshit meter, uh, mostly tech stuff. The looming battle of Swift. So let me give you a little bit of context here. Um, we'll see how this one plays out. But uh, the context is as follows. So Foundation right now is working really hard to define what is OpenStack core. Um, Nobody agrees on anything, pretty much. So the process is going very slowly. But the one thing that everybody agreed on at this point is that whatever is core should have pluggable architecture, should allow for different implementations to be substituted in. So for example, if you want storage and you want to have object storage, um, if you have Ceph with S3 APIs, um, that should also have the right to be called OpenStack. Um, Swift is core, is mother of core, because it's the second project in OpenStack contributed by Rackspace. But the problem with Swift is not very pluggable. Um, it's the entire implementation. Um, so I think that there's going to be kind of a looming battle uh, about Swift. Um, and the idea is that you know there's, there's valid arguments that uh, guys like Rackspace and probably guys that are monetizing uh, specifically Swift, like SwiftStack, will make that uh, OpenStack is not just kind of an API layer, which I personally agree with. It should not just be an API layer. Um, Swift is probably the most, arguably the most solid uh, production-ready project in all of OpenStack. Um, and uh, it was there day one. Um, and there's you know, certain counter arguments that uh, uh, the opponents, like for instance, Ink Tank, could likely make. And uh, again, on the PR meter, I think that this is mostly kind of uh, technology stuff. So this one we highlighted a little bit, but uh, I think that probably this is like a very vivid battle right now. There's a whole bunch of guys that there's a whole bunch of deployment tools that have been built, and there are cool tools that do a lot of stuff. And then there is the blessed official uh, OpenStack deployment program called Triple O in Tuscar. And this kind of looks like this, despite a lot of the deployment tools uh, that are out there in the market today. Uh, you know, arguably work better and have been deployed in production, and Triple O and Tuscar is just a framework, but they're blessed. So the customers ultimately, you know, don't care so much if, you know, it's a, it's a blessed framework or it's that project or it's this project. They care about stuff working. Um, but I agree that actually developing stuff under the auspices of a community rather than doing it in a silo is a better approach to ultimately getting a better product. So we'll see how this battle plays out. So final one. This is a um, kind of a battle that uh, not many of you are aware of, but I think that is happening. Um, and uh, that's a foundations battle for equality of all. And uh, the general idea here is that uh, the last thing that uh, the OpenStack Foundation wants is uh, for there to be kind of one guy that is the default go-to guy for everything OpenStack. Because in their mind, it's going to look like this. Um, and you know, there's probably like a personal, uh, somewhat selfish aspect to that, because uh, if this was to happen, then this would be the foundation, and this would be this one guy. So they're doing a lot of interesting things to even the plane. Uh, I think the one thing that they did recently is uh, the launch of the OpenStack Marketplace. 
um, effectively saying here, come to the OpenStack Foundation website and we'll list the you know, Red Hat training, but we'll also have Aptera training and cloud scaling training. And we are the guys to actually come and look at where, who the best training provider is. So they're kind of you know, taking away a little bit from the uh, marketing momentum of some of the big guys and evening the plane for the smaller guys. And uh, um, I personally know that this trend will continue and they'll continue pushing on it. And uh, this is about it. So any questions? All right, then. Oh, question right there. <clears throat> Expl I can, I can, yeah, I can, uh, I can talk about it a little bit more. So foundation is right now trying to figure out um, the definition of core. So right now there is a kind of effectively, you know, three categories of projects in OpenStack. One is core projects, two is integrated projects, and three is just, you know, related value-add projects, which is a bunch of guys writing code on StackForge. Um, and there's no very uh, concrete definition around each one of those levels, right? So it's very easy for somebody who just has a project on StackForge to say, well, we are an OpenStack-related project. So you're integrated and we're related. Uh, what's the difference? Um, and core integrated, again, the difference is vague. So the foundation is trying to come up with a very definitive set of guidelines for which project can legally uh, actually you know, leverage the OpenStack trademark in a particular way. Um, and uh, they're working on these guidelines right now. And the thing is that uh, one of the things that, that, that uh, everybody has agreed on is that whatever is core has to have pluggable architecture. You should be able to plug in various implementations. So for example, Nova, you can use multiple hypervisors. Cinder, you can use multiple storage backends. Quantum, you can use different networking solutions. Um, but Swift is the entire thing. It's the API with implementations, the whole thing. So what should happen to Swift? Should Swift be dumped out of core? Should Swift be just reduced to just the API layer? That's kind of a battle. So any more questions? Okay, then we're done. Thank you.